I've had a terrific problem uh, in the very limited amount of reading I've been in the course with this concept that seems to be presented of ego as sort of an evil thing, yeah. as opposed to all my also limited psychological reading, which says we've got to have a strong ego, we must integrate our personality and all that, yeah. and it's a real conflict in my comprehension. So. Yes. Uh, you sound like you're well prepared to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk about the ego. Cause let's unveil the thing. Let's go right at it. You know, um, it's a, the thing about the ego too is something. It's like you don't attempt to fight it or combat it because it loves the fight. And the course is just saying is just look at it. You know, it's once you can really look directly at it. Like fear is the only reason fears they seem to be maintained is because we try to look away from them. You ever had a dream where you just you're being chased by something? You just having the same dream all the time. You don't want to turn around and look at it. And basically, Jesus is just saying, "Fearful at all. Let's just, you know, we can look right at it, and it'll be gone like a puff of cloud." But to, to address your question too about the, the ego strength and integrate and so on and so forth, that's pretty much when I studied psychology and started going through that. That was pretty much um, basically a, a psychoanalysis. Is basically saying that. Um, that between the id, all these unconscious forces and the superego, force of morality, that the ego in, in that system is kind of like a mediator. And in that sense, if it's a mediator between these two combating forces that are in the mind, then that's where the idea of ego strength comes in, of wanting to build up ego strength. But what, what Freudian psychology really never got at was, it just was really describing the dark side of the mind. <laughs> that yes, the, the, there were these intrapsychic forces and there were these, um, you know, the moralities and everything, but, but the, that was all, all the three parts of, that were described, the id, the ego, and the superego are all part of, of the ego. And that there's another part of the mind, which Freudian psychology really didn't get into, which was spirit. You know, that's one thing when I was in psychology, it was kind of like, I just kept looking for where's the spirit? <laughs> or where, where, how do we integrate religion or spirituality with psychology because they seem to be antithetical. Or science, a lot of times when I would go into science, you know, I would wonder, where does science fit into all this? Then I got into reading quantum physics. And, you know, some of the quantum physicists, you know, started talking in terms that sounded also psychological, like perception. And, you know, that there's, you know, no reality in the world apart from what you think. And, and this experiments with particles where they try to do double-blind experiments and they try to, to take the experimenter out of the experiment and they would find that the thoughts in the thinker of the experimenter were moving the particles, you know, influencing the particles, and that they could no way remove the mind of the experimenter from, so it's like, oh, it's almost all these things start pointing to there's no, it's subjective, that the mind is influencing everything. So to get at that thing of, um, that's what really started, I started to see was that that whole thing about psychology wasn't really helping, it was very pessimistic, that there had to be another part of the mind that was, that I started reading when I was reading into Eastern philosophy and started reading books about this higher self. I started to say, yeah, that resonates. There has to be a higher self <laughs> as opposed to just a small self. And so that gave me a sense that there was something beyond that. Okay, uh, and, but I think you've been through the Jungian approach as well. How did your approach to ego compare with the others? Yeah, Jung seemed to really tap in to, to start to get in. He took this idea that Freud came along with, like the unconscious. It's been called the collective unconscious, and and he started to see that there was something, you know, the higher self, or there was something beyond this unconscious. This higher self, Jung said, was was able to communicate through dreams and through symbols, a lot of you know archetypes and so forth, and that in that many ways that was ways of. Uh, of kind of awakening towards this, this higher self. So I feel Young really started to articulate more that there was something beyond. And when you really get into the Course, I mean, it fits well with Jungian psychology in the sense that Jungian psychology said that there was this unconscious with all these beliefs that were kind of under the surface, and that you had to get in touch with the beliefs. And that's what the Course in Miracles is saying, is Jesus is saying that, that there are a lot of unconscious beliefs, and until you can look at them, until you can become aware of them, then they, they like they run you. You had asked about defining the ego, and there's one point at the, the back of the text where Jesus says that there, we can't, you can't have a definition for something that's, that is nothing, which is kind of interesting, you know, that's kind of like if I define it for you, it'll, it'll like giving it a reality. 
But he says we can point to the opposite, and the ego is opposite in every single way in shape is a, is a miracle. So he, then after he talks about the ego as the nothingness that it is, he starts once again pointing to the positive, or pointing to the, the, the divinity, the right mind. But um, the thing about death of the ego, too, you know, somebody asked me the other day, you know, somebody said, so it has to die, you know, at the end of everything, and I, I said, well, you know, you can look at it that way, but it's like you have to believe that it has ever lived before you can believe that it can die. I mean, you know, the more I study the ego, it's almost like it just gets unveiled for what it is. I've seen people work with the Course and they say, love your ego and hate your ego. And, and a lot of times people will perceive when they're reading the book, it's, it's like, it seems like, boy, this thing is up to no good. <laughs> but in a sense, Jesus says that um, you made the ego by believing in it. And you can dispel the ego by withdrawing your belief in it. You made the ego by believing in it, and you can dispel the ego by withdrawing your belief in it. See, that's what bothers me a little bit. Um, I think some, I, I feel sometimes there's so much emotion put into trying to destroy this ego like it's an entity. I mean, like it's replaced the devil. Mm, and I yeah. just, I, I, just, you know, yeah. I can't. And he, he actually describes it at the beginning. There's a point early in the text where he kind of goes through and he really describes the ego, you know, pretty well. And then he says, I had to do that so you wouldn't dismiss it too lightly. And that's when he starts introducing at that point that it's obviously it's just a belief and you made it by believing in it and you can dispel it. But, but in the early part, the very early part, you know, it's kind of like, um, so it's not just brushed away because that's part of the ego's defense mechanism is, is to just kind of brush fear under and, you know, kind of dismiss fear or repress it or deny it. And then all of a sudden it just comes up, you know. And, and this is, of course, in, in dispelling the ego, not in, you know, trying not to... Not in fighting it. it. That, that's and what bothered me, the battles that, that seem to be, you know, seem to be being fought. Uh, and I don't... I think it would be easier to withdraw your energy from that belief system and try to fight it. In the end, that's all the dispelling the ego is, is remembering to laugh at it. And then it's not like you kill it at the end, it's you laugh at it. You laugh at it. You laugh it away. You laugh it away. You know, that's, that's, it's a joke. Now when the mind is in a sleeping state, you know, then it's like part of its mind is where the Holy Spirit lives and the Course calls it the right mind. And this is sanity. This is the connection back to Christ and to the Father. And then the dark side of the mind is where the ego resides. So to say that, to even say love the ego, you know, it would be kind of to say to love nothing. You know, it, 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 in order to truly love something, it has to be, it has to exist. So the Course is definitely not saying love the ego, and it's definitely not saying hate the ego, because as we just, you were mentioning earlier, when you fight against it, it seems to just roar even more. But it is important to see that, that the ego is up to no good in the sense that that the purpose of the ego is, is sickness, fragmentation, guilt, sin, death. And the Holy Spirit's purpose is healing and waking up. And it's important to start to tell the difference between the two. Because until we can tell the difference between the two, then we'll still think that the ego has something to offer us. And as long as we believe it still has something to offer us, then we'll still invest in its way of thinking, and we'll still feel guilt, we'll still feel, you know, pain and separation. So much of the Course talks about the ego, not because it's real, but because the, the sleeping mind believes it's real, and to the extent that it believes in it, it has a hold on it. So Jesus is just saying, this is how this works. This is this, this is what to look for. This is what's going on for the mind that believes in the ego. And when you can start to see what it is and recognize it for what it is, then that's the way out. The ego doesn't know love. The ego doesn't understand love. That's why it's almost impossible to love well, it isn't something that is, is not lovable and does not love you back. Yeah, but isn't ego our personality? No. Your personality is your personality. Well, the, the personality, it, 
all of our personalities do have our differences. You know, some people seem to be aggressive or outgoing. Some people seem to be shy and reserved. You know, all the different skills. Some people seem to have great mental skills, and other people people seem to be more feeling and sensitive. That when you talk about personality, there is enormous variation. And these personalities seem to conflict at times, too, you know. Sometimes people think of them as complementary, but a lot of times in, in husband and wife or boyfriend, girlfriend, or even in families, there seems to be stark personality differences. And in a sense, whenever there's conflict, it's not the Holy Spirit that's involved. It is the ego. I mean, there is an ego basis. And, and basically, the personality self, or the Course calls it the self-concept, with a small s instead of the big capital S for Christ, is is part of a construction that, that when the mind, when the separation seemed to happen, the mind was so afraid of this light that it tried to run away from it into the darkness as far as, as, far as it could have. So it started to stack beliefs. It, it was so dark and horrifying, the thought that you can separate from your creator, disconnect from your source. It's the, it was the most horrifying thought conceivable. It wasn't true in, in, in the ultimate sense, but, it, but the mind believed it. It was horrifying. So the mind, instantly the Holy Spirit was given his answer. So now we have a mind that's used to wholeness and completion, you know, in the kingdom. It's used to wholeness all the time. Now it's it got two completely irreconcilable thought systems the Holy Spirit's and the egos in it. And the mind's used to hold it. It's like intolerable to try to hold on to both of these at the same time. So what the mind did is the world was made up as like a movie screen. You know, when you go to the movies and you see the screen and all the different images of movies, the world was made up as a screen and the ego said, project the split out there onto the screen and then you can forget about the split in the mind. And you can see the duality out there on the world instead of the duality between the thought systems. So basically, once the mind falls asleep, it sees a world of duality, male, female, good, bad, right, wrong, hot, cold, fast, slow, you know, wide, skinny, just, yeah. Victim, victimizer. Victim, victimizer. It's, it's kind of, a, that's part of this big, giant optical illusion to, instead of looking in, in my mind and seeing, I have, a, I have a split in my mind that has to be healed. The, the trick is, oh, the split's out there, you know, in the world. And there are good people and there are bad people. There are you know, the old, like the cowboy movies, the good guys and the bad guys. And and therefore, as soon as I split the sonship on my brothers into camps and see the world of duality out there, then I can project and blame and be angry at the victimizers. And I can pity the victim. The person is saying it's a trick scam, whenever you blame your brother, when you blame the IRS or blame your parents or blame your spouse or blame your dog or blame the weather or blame your boss or whatever, that you're trying to hurl the guilt. You're trying to hurl this feeling of unworthiness that you feel away onto them. And really, it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't get rid of the problem. Because when you do that, the mind also believes that somehow people are going to creep projections are going to creep back, and then it starts getting real defensive. It's kind of like when, if you've ever felt guilty or, or angry at somebody and attacked them, and then it's feared that they were going to call call back or tell your friends or whatever, you know, as soon as the attack goes out, then it's like, oh my gosh, what have I done? And, you know, it's got to be real defensive. Pride, Eagle. That's a good question because it's, it's like... A lot of the messages I got when I was growing up, you know, was take pride in, take pride in, take pride in. And it's like, well, wait a minute, is pride good or bad? Or sometimes good, sometimes bad. And uh, it's on page 97, uh, Jesus talks about the ego and its uses for the world and the body. And that's one of the three, the three main things that the ego uses the body for. In, in, a, in a real subtle way, the, the way it maintains the guilt is because pride is always based on form. There's a, there's a body identification. I'm proud of my ethnic heritage. I'm proud to, to be an American. I'm proud of my Cincinnati Reds. <laughs> I'm proud, to, you know, to have to your degrees, status. I'm proud of my wealth. I'm proud. You know, you can see where it's all form-based. And, and the reason that pride is so sneaky, you know, is because 
just like he says in the Bible, that's that's what the ways of the world are. The, the ways of the world, you know, bigger, better, more, the fame, the wealth, the recognition, 